at a mate 40 here. So one of the least attractive traits is helplessness. Like unnecessary learned helplessness. I find it very unattractive. And it seems to be dominating the majority opinion in American politics right now that uh, it's just inevitable that Joe Biden will become the nominee of the Democratic Party for President of the United States. And Joe Biden is manifestly unfit to be President of the United States, right? He made that clear last Thursday night in his disastrous performance at a debate with Donald Trump. Another thing that kills me about the majority pundit reaction is that uh, Joe Biden's perfectly capable of operating as President of the United States. He's just not capable of campaigning for President of the United States. So Joe Biden apparently has a hard time getting going before 10 a.m. And he has a hard time operating after 4 p.m. So he has about six hours a day where he can do work. And, and this is acceptable for President of the United States. Uh, if we get into a nuclear crisis, and only the President of the United States can make the call whether or not we launch nuclear weapons. Uh, that, that can't be devolved onto his staff. So what you hear from the Biden team is that he has a highly competent staff. And when you're voting for Joe Biden, you're also voting for his highly competent staff. But this is the same side who's been making the argument for the past five years that democracy is on the ballot and that voting for Joe Biden is a vote for democracy. But people didn't vote for Joe Biden's staff. I, he, he clearly has not been up to the office of President of the United States since he took office, right? He was saved from having to campaign by COVID. Like a frail old man who had that vacant, checked out stare back in 2018. And now the cognitive decline has apparently become particularly precipitous over the past few months in 2024. And then here's another element of the learned helplessness that uh, seems to dominate much of American political discourse among elites right now. And that is, well, by all the rules, all the procedures, by all the precedents, according to the bylaws, Joe Biden is going to become the Democratic nominee for president because the laws say that, because he won the delegates. And if he's determined to run as the Democratic nominee for president, no one can stop him. Right? So this is the legal perspective. So what's more powerful, right? Is it the situation or is it the law? And I contend to you that the situation has more power than the law. But the dominant discourse among elites with regard to Joe Biden right now is that the law says that uh, Joe Biden is going to be the Democratic nominee for president. But when following the law results in a suicidal choice, right? Running Joe Biden for president of the United States is a suicidal choice, not just for the Democrats, but also for the country. And the United States of America is in peril right now because a senile old man who is checked out much of the time mentally and just cognitively not there is in the office of president of the United States. So I am a big respecter of law and order. But I love the law, but there are things that are more important than the law, such as survival and the health and protection of your people. And so America is an incredibly individualist country, and as a result, in individualist countries, right, it's probably the most individualist country, everything has to be negotiated. Right? You have to negotiate more things in more depth 
in the United States than any other country of which I'm aware because it's so individualist and therefore there's so little common feeling. Right? You definitely have to negotiate far more of life in the United States compared to Australia, which on a world stage is probably in the top 10 of individualist countries. But you still have to negotiate much more your interactions and your contracts and your procedures in the United States and in Australia or in England or in New Zealand, these other individualist countries or in Canada. Because in a country that was not as individualist, right, that had more of a sense of common feeling, more of a sense of nationhood, right, this situation would be governed more by norms, right, that meaning understanding of what is right and wrong, than by laws. But in the United States, because we have so little social trust, we don't tend to devolve as many of these decisions to norms because we don't share many norms because we're so varied, so diverse. We have so little social cohesion and social trust. And so we have to overwhelmingly depend upon law and precedent and procedure much more than any other country. Now, is the law a veto in this extreme situation? And I contend to you, the law is not a death warrant. The United States Constitution is not a death warrant. And I'll give you some analogies. I know a lot of Japanese, and they will contend to me that uh, Japan is severely limited in the steps that it can take to defend itself because of its constitution that was imposed upon it by the United States. And so the Japanese have come to love the learned helplessness that they've developed by noting, well, our constitution was imposed on us by the United States and it severely limits what we can do to build up a military to defend ourselves and so we have to rely on the United States for military protection. Right? This is like women I've dated, who once we get locked into that intimate relationship, and they know I want to keep coming back, right? they start becoming more and more helpless and start offloading onto me more and more things that they're perfectly capable of doing for themselves, such as a Google search, or just all sorts of things that uh, they think, oh, this will make me more feminine, more attractive, and lock me into this relationship with 40 if I can be helpless. That, uh, that 40 loves me because I'm pathetic. And initially, right, that has been a turn on. I was able to sweep into a woman's life and transform it and and rescue her, right? There was a brief period where that was a turn on, but it very quickly becomes a turn off. And Japan has operated, even though its security situation has grown increasingly dire with the rise of China, with this learned helplessness, oh, well, because of the constitution that the US imposed upon us, we have to rely on America to protect us. Well, if breaking your constitution is what is required to survive, are not the Japanese ready to break their constitution or to change their constitution? Right? Law and constitution should not be a death warrant. Similarly, there's the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and many Jews would abide by this commandment, and they would not fight back on the Sabbath, and as a result, they were slaughtered. Well, this didn't last very long in Jewish life. Very quickly, the rabbis, approximately, 2200 years ago, made the point if you need to fight to survive on the Sabbath, then you should absolutely fight. And so you can't just check out from your responsibilities by saying, oh, it's the Sabbath. The Sabbath prohibits us from doing work. Work includes picking up weapons. We can't protect ourselves uh, because God said so. Right? And those Jews who took that attitude got wiped out. Well, the Jews who were willing to pick up weapons and fight back on the Sabbath, they survived. In 1973, Israel was attacked on Yom Kippur, and Jews grabbed their weapons, and after 
couple of days of significant losses and setbacks, right, they, they fought back and eventually won. Approximately 2,000 years ago in Jewish life, in Israel, the Jewish law of not loaning at interest meant that uh, funds for loans had essentially dried up. And so Rabbi Hillel came along with an emendation to the law, allowing something called a prusbol, so that when you'd lend money to a fellow Jew for his business, it wasn't a loan, it was an investment. And he created a way that you could lend money to your fellow Jews essentially at interest, but it's not called lending, it's called investing. So, America in general, and the United States, uh, Democrats in particular, right, they have a choice. Do you want to just go along with the law and helplessness that uh, Joe Biden is one of the delegates? He has the right to be Democratic nominee for president. And he's clearly unfit for office and clearly unfit to campaign. Or will the dams st start breaking? See, we can only maintain our allegiance to law within certain narratives, right? Law also depends upon narrative. And so the narrative that we have to follow the law is a powerful narrative. And that's perhaps the most powerful narrative right now with regard to Joe Biden. But if another narrative became more powerful, such as that Joe Biden is manifestly unfit to be president of the United States, then you'd have you have a transformation of attitudes towards the law. So Joe Biden and his team and his family are clearly living at war with reality for the past five years. And now the war against reality has become increasingly intense as it's obvious to anyone who hasn't thrown in the lot with Joe Biden that he is manifestly unfit for office. And so even though Legal procedures say only Joe Biden can decide that he wants to step away from being the Democratic Party nominee. He has to find support for his narrative. Right? If he can't find any support for his narrative among the people that he respects, right, then it will be increasingly difficult to hang on to his narrative. I'll give you an example. I am a convert to Orthodox Judaism. If, when I encountered Orthodox Jews, I went to Dublin in an Orthodox synagogue, said, we don't count you as Jewish, we won't count you as a minion, it would be difficult, if not impossible, for me to maintain the narrative that uh, I'm, I'm an Orthodox Jew. Right? My, my narratives depend upon getting some support from other people. We all depend on other people for support for our narratives. <laughs> It requires right, increasing amounts of strength to maintain your narrative in opposition to other people's narratives. And Joe Biden depends upon narrative support. Yeah, you may have the law on your side, but if the power of the narrative is increasingly against you, eventually that's going to overwhelm the law because the law operates within narrative doesn't just operate on its own. Right? Laws are enforced by human beings. Human beings operate within the narrative. So we have all sorts of laws on the books that are enforced or not enforced differently depending on a location and depending on the, the dominant narrative. So after George Floyd died, right, a dominant narrative with regard to policing became there's too much of it and the police should back off from enforcing the law because when you enforce the law it leads to racially disparate results and so the laws didn't immediately change but narrative changed and so the police took the hint and they backed off from enforcing the law and so too if the narrative increasingly goes against joe biden uh, he's not going to be able to sustain his position, right? Is the situation the boss or is the law the boss? Sometimes the law is the boss, but often the situation is the boss, the narrative is the boss. That situation is Joe Biden is manifestly unfit to be president of the United States. He's unfit to run as a Democratic nominee. 
rules, procedures, and precedent say this is just how it is. Joe Biden going to be the nominee. But uh, as more and more leading Democrats I start noting that uh, Joe Biden should step aside, right? the narrative that supports the law is going to collapse. Oh, did you notice how Joe Biden's team overcorrected on his makeup last night? So it made him look orange. So he had horribly pale makeup during the Thursday night debate. Now his team's overcorrected. He still looked much better last night than he did on Thursday night. So lawyers analyze the world through law, right? Economists analyze the world through economic principles, right? The US has more lawyers than almost any other country. And so law plays a, a bigger role in the United States than in other countries. And so the law is clear, all right, that uh, Joe Biden has the right to his nominees and to be the Democratic nominee. And there's no alternative when we have so little common feelings, so little social cohesion, social trust, all right? We, we live in a country where everything has to be negotiated. And so we, we rely on legal precedents and laws and uh, lawsuits much more in this country than pretty much any other country of which I'm aware. But these laws and lawsuits all operate within wider narratives. And there's still a significant narrative out there that I share. Joe Biden is manifestly unfit to be president of the United States. But he should resign the presidency. To deny that is to deny reality. And reality ends up winning, right? You don't you don't get to win against reality. So yeah, it's entirely possible that the narrative that we should follow the law and the delegates must go to Joe Biden, he must run again as a Democratic nominee, that could still hold out. But it's in opposition to reality. And so you're getting increasing number of leading Democrats questioning whether Joe Biden is fit for office, right? And questioning that is a significant first step. Second step is to say, yes, yeah, it's obviously clear he's manifestly unfit for office. So you have more important Democrats, including Nancy Pelosi, questioning if he's fit for office. And this trickle is going to turn into a flood. And I suspect as days go by, Joe Biden will not be able to maintain his narrative. Joe Biden's team will not be able to maintain their narrative that he's going to be the Democrat nominee. And so he will step aside for the good of the country when his narrative encounters too much opposition. So it's just a trickle of Democratic politicians asking Joe Biden to step aside right now. But this trickle is going to turn into a flood. The situation will win over the rules.